Our next speaker is, sorry, we get the slides ready. The next speaker is Dr. Jerry Malloy. Jerry is a health psychologist in the School of Psychology here at NUI Galway. He received his PhD from the University of St. Andrews. He's also worked in the University of Aberdeen, University College London, and University of Stirling in Scotland. His research expertise is mainly in the area of behavioral medicine with a particular interest in the psychological and social determinants of treatment adherence for a broad range of medicines that are taken across the lifespan. He leads the medication adherence across the lifespan group here in NUI Galway and is co-leader of the Health and Wellbeing Cluster in the Whitaker Institute for Innovation and Societal Change. Welcome, Jay. Thank you very much, Valerie, and thanks to Brendan for inviting me and NUIG uh, for hosting the event and Novartis for funding the event. <coughs> so this is the problem that I suppose provides the, the focus for the day. We don't get the, the full benefits of lots of treatments that are available because of poor adherence. So that's a real focus of what I do, what I look at in the several studies I've been involved with. So the empirical studies I've been involved with have been very much influenced by members of my family. So I'm going to start with my mother. This is Margaret, 67 years of age. Uh, she's holding Killian, my son, and she's lived with asthma for several years. She's on a preventer inhaler and a symptom reliever inhaler. This is my father who had a heart attack, myocardial infarction or um, acute coronary event, um, as the cardiologist would say. Uh, when he was 50, 1997, he, he lived for seven years after that. But in that period between, ha between having the acute event and dying from heart failure, he was on the standard regime of medication, a range of antihypertensive medications, statins, um, anticoagulants. And I suppose watching him live with that illness made me think a lot about the difficulty of self-managing uh, a chronic condition, and particularly managing the medication regime. And obviously, Killian, um, he's encountered a number of adherence difficulties. And the challenges of thinking about adherence at that part of the lifespan are something I'm going to touch on. So I have to draw on these three people throughout the talk to, to make some of these issues more concrete. So empirical studies, well, I think I can classify the, the main kinds of studies that I've been involved in into three categories. First of all, the descriptive studies, where we're looking at what's the extent or the nature of the problem here, how common it is adherence in this condition. And the big difficulty with the descriptive studies is measurement. And I think other people have mentioned this already. Uh, the measurement of adherence is a real challenge. So this top study looked at adherence to medication in people who had an acute coronary event. We tracked them over one year and looked at adherence immediately at discharge, six months and 12 months. So I've been involved in studies like that. A lot of my work is also looking at the extent to which psychological factors, be they beliefs about treatments or things like personality, these stable aspects of the way people think, act and feel, looking at are these things associated with medication adherence. So this next study is a predictive study where we conducted a meta-analysis of studies that measured this aspect of personality and medication adherence. The other category of research is that research that's concerned with intervening to change behaviour, those uh, behaviour change studies. So if we could just focus on that for a moment, because I guess that's where psychology and, and the behavioural science of behaviour change has potentially a very big role to play in providing some of the solutions to the problem of medication adherence. So this last study looked at developing a solution like that in the context of people living with epilepsy. So in healthcare, when most of us want to start studying a new research area, the first place we often go to see what the, the standard of randomized controlled trial evidence is, is the Cochrane Library. And if we're developing a new area with research students, we often ask them, is there a Cochrane review um, in your area of interest. And there has been a Cochrane review on looking at interventions to enhance medication adherence um, for, well, I think, almost 10 years now. 
and this is, I think it's the third iteration or update of the Cochrane Review led by Haynes Group in Canada. So this was published last year, um, and one of the striking things about that, this was an update from the 2008 version, was the number of new studies that emerged in that five year period. So there were 182 studies in this review, and there were, I, th I think it was 109 new studies in that eight year period. So clearly there's a lot of research activity in this area, but one of the disappointing things about this is there was no quantitative synthesis of these studies because of the heterogeneity in measurement, in intervention approaches, the, the view of the, this group, as in their previous reviews, was you just can't quantitatively synthesize this. So th this is a problem. And the kind of conclusions they have when they, when they look at the individual studies in smaller categories is most of the best design studies, the most rigorous data we have available, concludes with, when we look at all that data in its entirety, that most of what we have is complex, not very effective, that effects are inconsistent from study to study, and only a minority of the best trials, those with the lowest risk of bias, improved both the medication taking and the associated clinical outcome. So most of what has been evaluated is not very effective. So we're still in that position where the treatments we have can't be realized. And as I said, one of the big issues is about measurement of adherence. Uh, and this was very much highlighted in this review that we need uh, objective adherence measure measures and, and just generally better quality studies to uh, <coughs> establish some, a solid evidence base on which practitioners can support people who are taking medications. So as a psychologist, I would very much have the view that adherence is a behavior. And in order to look at that, well, we have to look at issues around motivation, to what extent do people want to take the medication? Uh, so Chad talked a little bit about understanding. Um, other speakers today have talked about the extent to which people believe the treatment is required. Is it necessary? Do they have any worries about side effects? And that's very much about motivation. The next important thing a behavioral scientist would ask is are people capable of engaging in this behavior? Have they got the, the cognitive capacity? Is the medication regime too complex? Uh, do they have the skills to self-manage this illness for what is often decades, or in some cases, the entire lifespan? And then they also have to have the physical and social opportunity to consistently engage in the behavior. And I refer to this tripartite way of describing the behavioral science is the will, skills, and drills approach. Do patients have the will, skills, and drills for their pills? Uh, I had a bit of time in the office that day, and uh, <laughs> that's what emerged from that. But in addition to thinking about things about motivation, capability, and opportunity, we also, in psychology, very much emphasize this idea of lifespan, that the capacity to self-regulate your behavior, it develops as people age. Obviously, Killian here, his capacity for managing a, a medical condition or use treatment is very limited from an adult. But as Sean Deneen very clearly highlighted earlier, the adolescent phase is, is a phase where um, the, the challenges for self-management of illness are, are quite different from both pediatric and the adult distinction. So the first thing we have to acknowledge is taking daily medication for several years can be very difficult. And as I said, my original inspiration to looking at this area was my father's experience. He managed quite well with this uh, cocktail of, I think it was between six and eight medications he took daily. And he was probably one of these people who had classified as conscientious, very good at record keeping. He was a news agent. He was very meticulous about his warfarin, this anticoagulant, which is potentially a very dangerous drug that involves a lot of monitoring, but he was very good at keeping the warfarin diary. And my mother, on the other hand, who lives with asthma, she's one of these people, if she's not experiencing the effects of the medication, she's not going to take it. So in the case of her asthma, she's got the preventer inhaler, which she doesn't see the purpose of, and the reliever inhaler, which obviously instantly relieves the symptoms. So I think in this context of no symptom relief, it's a real challenge, and it obviously requires trust in healthcare providers uh, for adherence to be uh, likely. Be because you're taking 
this idea of the benefit of treatment on face value. And I think one way that really illustrates how different medication is from other forms of treatment is, is the example of glasses. So if anyone who has glasses in the room, could you just take them off for one sec? Just take off your glasses for one sec. Now most of you who uh, are long-sighted or short-sighted, you're probably experiencing symptoms now. And if those of you who don't wear glasses, if you were to take the glasses from most people who've just taken their glasses off, you would be experiencing the side effects of a treatment that you shouldn't be prescribed. You put them on, the symptoms are gone. The effect of that treatment, and you can think of glasses as a medical treatment, is instant. But most medicines don't work like that. And the reason I think that's a very good example is this was one that I encountered myself with Killian. So we identified, and the question he was going to said, he's starting to, his eyes beginning to turn inwards. And his mother, his mother's a general practitioner, she, she saw this quite early, and she said, potentially we have a problem here, we need to take him to an optician. And before we even went to the optician and the, the doctor to see about this issue, I knew there was going to be an adherence challenge here because Killian doesn't do anything I ask. He's just, he's one of those children. <laughs> so we got the glasses and my, my wife said to me, you know, it's funny, they just give you the glasses and they don't tell you, you know, what to do. They just, you walk out with a child in the glasses. And I said, a lot like general practitioners. And she's a general <laughs> practitioner. So she didn't like that point. But I knew this was going to be an issue, so I spoke to some colleagues about how this might be managed. And true enough, when Killian came home with the glasses, he, said, he threw them at me, not taken them. So some of my colleagues said, if you get him to do something he enjoys, and he, he likes watching TV, and you gradually expose him to the glasses, well, that would work. So I started off by saying, Killian, will you hold them? He held them for about 10 minutes. Will you put them on your head? He did that. That took about another half hour before we got it on his head. But finally, we got them on him, and adherence wasn't a problem. And as I said, the reason for that is he experienced the immediate benefit of the treatment. And I think sometimes we talk about understanding. Patients need to understand how the treatment works. I think patients need to experience that the treatment works. And sometimes we forget that, that most medical treatments, obviously glasses work like this, but uh, outside of asthma inhalers, there's a lot of treatments don't provide the instant experience of efficacy. So a lot of behavioral science focuses on the idea of establishing habits. And that's quite important because if you can establish a habit in relation to medication taking, motivation isn't that important. If the behavior becomes uh, automatic, you don't really need to motivate people to want to do a behavior. And if you think about something like toothbrushing, something we do every day, most people don't get up in the morning and think, reflect on the idea of brushing their teeth. It's just immediately triggered by being in the bathroom. So how do habits work? Well, you link a particular cue. It could be the kettle in the morning with a particular routine. It could be making your cup of tea, and then you get the reward of enjoying the cup of tea. So one argument in the use of habits in medication adherence is to insert a routine like medication taking within an existing routine. Could be like making tea or brushing your teeth or whatever the issue is. And these habits, what, the habits that we all have, what they are, are they energy saving shortcuts that all of us develop to make negotiating our worlds quicker, more efficient. So a lot of studies in the last couple of years have attempted to establish these habitual routines into medication taking. And here's one example, a study from colleagues in the University of Stirling, where they conducted a randomized controlled trial among patients uh, who had a stroke and were taking antihypertensive medications. And the intervention involved introducing a plan linked to an environmental cue to help establish a better medication taking routine. So you see two examples here, John and Mary, and they both identified the particular behavior that they were gonna link taking the blood pressure medication to. In addition to that habit or routine formation, they also addressed any mistaken beliefs that patients had about stroke medication, about the antihypertensive medication. So there was Initially, the intervention was to change the behavior, the very much just do it approach. 
And then afterwards, there was also this aspect of the intervention that looked at people's motivation in terms of their beliefs about the, the necessity of treatment and their concerns. So there was both uh, an action component to the intervention and a motivation component. And that led to 10% of the doses been taken on schedule and in this study they had one of these electronic monitors of um, pill, the, the electronic pill caps, this medication event monitoring system. So, so quite some strong evidence there, S similar studies have looked at this in type 2 diabetes developing these kind of habitual routines and they've identified similar kind of results. So a group in Oxford led by Andrew Pharma have produced similar findings. And those studies, they also look at, well, does the intervention work in the way that we propose? Is it the case that this intervention leads to a change in concerns, a reduction in concerns, and a reduction in forgetting, as our theory supposes, and further analysis of the data suggests that that is the mechanism of action, that the treatment works in that way. We see this mediated effect, whereby these two things explain the, the improvement in the doses taken on schedule. Now there's other simple evidence-based interventions to improve adherence and many of you who work with patients will be familiar with the idea of a dose set box and again there's a Cochrane review looking at the efficacy and effectiveness of dose set boxes and they lead to approximately 11% improvement in medication taking. But I think what we have to be aware there is sometimes people are reluctant to use some of these solutions particularly things like uh, the dose set box. So sometimes when you do qualitative work and you ask people who are on complex regimes why they don't use a dose set box, they say things like, well, people might think my memory is failing. There's embarrassment sometimes about using some of these technical, well-designed solutions um, because, not surprisingly, some people like to keep their health vulnerabilities and, and their preferences for treatment private. And I think that idea of the user experience of an adherence solution is something that we need to take into account when we design, design adherence solutions. So you need to speak to uh, patients and ask them, well, do, does this work for you? And I think that has become particularly, um, that, that I've become particularly aware of that in my study of prescription mm -hmm. contraception. So in the last couple of years, I've looked at the use of prescription contraception in young women um, and the interesting thing about prescription contraception is the the most effective methods of prescription contraception aren't the most preferred methods and there's a complex range of reasons for that but when I was trying to develop some of the solutions to improve adherence one issue kept coming up, kept coming up was young women said well I wouldn't want people to know I was taking this treatment especially people are still living in the family home or with friends. So I, I think some of the, the solutions that we design have to really uh, involve uh, the people who might potentially use the solutions. One other thing that I've just inserted because I, Brendan invited me, this was a, an economics seminar, I thought, I, well, I have to say something about the idea of financial incentives to improve adherence. Um, so so I, I've included this slide to, to address that issue. So there is evidence to support the idea that in some situations providing financial reinforcement for taking medication works. So this early study by uh, Volp and Lowenstein, one of the leaders in the behavioural economics, looked at using a lottery system um, to support people who are on warfarin treatment. And there was proof of principle there. To, to my mind, this kind of intervention strategy seems complex to deliver. Um, and in the other studies, so there's at least 15 randomized controlled trials that have evaluated paying patients to take their medications. Um, they do work, but I guess there's a lot of um, complexity around using that as an intervention strategy. I would say that this is no longer, I suppose, um, a kind of niche area in that some of the mainstream medical journals, the British Medical Journal published a study late last year looking at paying people who were taking antipsychotic medication to uh, turn up to get their, their maintenance injections. So these were depot injections, these long-acting medications for people living with um, schizophrenia or, or psychosis symptoms 
And the study clearly showed that this led to better adherence for treatment. But whether these kind of intervention strategies are used in a more widespread way, I guess there needs to be um, a debate about that. And I think some people in the room would have given that more, more thought than perhaps I have. Some people in, the in previous talks have talked about the potential for e-health and, and mobile health, I'm thinking particularly about the use of phones and wearable devices to support behaviour change. And that obviously is potentially a very promising area to support adherence. Um, in Galway, we're quite interested in this. and um, We had a, an mHealth uh, conference back in June and we, we developed a great buzz around this. Our hashtag for the event, we're delighted to say a bet, Finch and O'Toole that day and Dublin Zoo. We were just <laughs> not as, quite as good as Joe Duffy. You can see the Joe Duffy live line was the top trending hashtag that day. But we had a fantastic event and we had some people from academia and industry who talked about the potential for mobile health solutions to behaviour change. So th there is potential there. One of the PhD students who's working in our group has looked at what is available in the likes of the iTunes Store and the Google Play Store in terms of medication adherence apps and done a content analysis of the behaviour change techniques that are designed into them. And Emer's work shows that quite limited use of established behaviour change techniques in many of the existing medication adherence apps. And I guess one of the issues there is that some of these companies are moving so fast to produce products that there's probably not a lot of thought gone into the, the behavioural science that underpins these interventions. So this will come out soon in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. So Emer aims to develop um, a medication adherence support uh, for people with hypertension. And one of the great potentials of some of this mobile health is the potential for continuous monitoring of medication adherence. And the reason why that's so important is that a given individual who has a certain level of, of non-adherence, let's say we say that 90% adherence is required to get the benefit of this drug, that 90% adherence might be dramatically different depending on the individual. So here we have a slide that represents four people who are 90% adherent. The first top left-hand person wasn't taking the drug at all after they prescribed it. The second person on the top right discontinued the treatment earlier than prescribed. The third person on the bottom left is someone who probably went on holiday and forgot their medication. So you have this couple of week block where they're not taking the medication at all and then you have the kind of classic frequent missed doses. And I guess when you look at how a drug is influencing a symptom, be it high blood pressure or HbA1c, all of these different patterns are going to produce very different effects depending on when you take your measurements. So I think this continuous monitoring is probably something that's very important for clinicians. The technology is improving um, and I guess there's, there's going to be a lot of development in this area because if you really want to understand the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of drugs, you really need this continuous data on when and how people are taking the medication. So the future will involve harnessing the potential of e-health and m-health technologies for adherence measurement and support. I think there probably needs to be very dramatic new configurations of both primary and secondary healthcare to support some of this. So it's not the case that these things can be refined without broader changes happening in healthcare. So we see some challenges in developing electronic health records. This is way beyond that. The, the, these kind of systems, like TickerFit, is one that we're hearing a lot of, about. This, this requires, I suppose, a whole e-health ecosystem to really work well. And I, I would provide the caveat that what is critical from some of the qualitative work that we do when we look at adherence is functioning personal and healthcare provider social relationships. We know that that is critical for self-management of illness. So there are hundreds of studies that show that people with more social support from their spouse or other family members are more adherent. There's also lots of studies that really emphasize the important of importance of a good relationship with your main healthcare provider who's supporting you. So our efforts to improve adherence and self-management need to take that into account. Some of the technological solutions, I 
think probably need to enhance the relationships that people have with their healthcare providers rather than replace that healthcare relationship. And I think there's a real danger if there's a view that um, some of the technological fixes are actually weakening uh, the relationship people have with the people that they really rely on to, to, to manage their illness. So I, I suppose the bottom line I would have is that behavioral science is essential for understanding adherence. Um, and obviously I'm biased, I'm a psychologist, I'm gonna say behavioral science is really important. And it's nice to see someone else from a different discipline, a clinician who through his career would have seen thousands of patients make the case for behavioral science. So this is Professor uh, Martin Eccles, He's a retired general practitioner based at the University of Newcastle. And a large part of Martin's work was about changing healthcare professional behavior. So he's the editor of implementation science. And a large part of that work is about getting clinicians to change the behavior. And he said in a paper 10 years ago, if you do that, if you practice research into behavior change in health professionals without theory and methods from behavioral science, well, that's the equivalent to exploring the clinical role of an antihypertensive drug without understanding the pharmacology of the drug, the physiology of blood pressure, and the pathophysiology of hypertension. So I think to change behavior, just as there's a behavioral uh, pharmacological science, there's also behavioral science that um, needs to support this work. And I think if you don't use that, Martin argues that you'll develop an islagate intervention. And that is like it stands for, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and there's lots of interventions to change behavior that use that principle. There's not really a coherent uh, justification for why we design in that way. It's just kind of, well, this might work. So we can do better if we use some behavioral science. So I think I'd always make the argument that the pharmacological science, that creates the opportunity for better health. So development of staff and new treatments, that creates this potential for health gain. <coughs> Behavioral science, I think, helps realize the potential of new pharmacotherapies. So I'd just like to end by saying that we've got it. We're, myself and a colleague in Scotland are developing a special issue of the journal Psychology of Health with the title Medication Adherence Across the Lifespan. And we're inviting papers that are addressing either theory, methods, or interventions. So we'll have an end of February deadline for abstracts and a July submission. Um, so if any of you are doing research in this area, please get in contact to, to, and we can discuss whether potentially this could be in this journal with the issue which will appear next year. And I'd just like to final, finally finish by thanking all the research funders and collaborators that um, I've mentioned in the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>